Uh, so my name is Adam, and this is uh, Kevin. Kevin's going to start talking here soon. Um, so tonight we're looking, we're going to take kind of a first look at um, Angular Universal. Um, so this is a, this is a very, still a very new technology. Um, it's very much in flux, um, and a lot of things are changing, but we thought it would be interesting to kind of look at what's here today um, you know, talk about what it is and why you might want to to build an app that's um, uh, universal capable. Uh, and then we'll we'll spend a little bit of time looking at um, an example app to see how some of these pieces fit together and how some of the stuff works. So I think uh, Kevin will begin. Yeah. <clears throat> thanks, Adam. Uh, yeah, I'm Kevin, and thanks for coming out. Um, Quick question: Who's uh, who knows what Angular Universal is, or has looked at it, or up a little bit? Of it? Okay, it's a couple people. Cool. So um, yeah, like Adam said, it's still in flux, but I think there's enough out there to make it really exciting to start looking at this and uh, starting to uh, kind of envision how we can tie this into our Angular app. So, so I'm just curious: Has anyone built anything yet with Universal? Anything in production yet? All right. All right. Very good. <clears throat> All right, so what is Angular Universal? Um, it is JavaScript code that can execute on the client and server. Um, formerly known as um, isomorphic, but this has uh, slowly started to change over just to universal uh, JavaScript, or Angular Universal in this case. Um, so um, just like it sounds, we can build our Angular app and, uh, and you know, either Render it on the server or the client, uh, depending on our use case. So, um, why would you want to use Angular Universal? Um, I think the the biggest benefit is going to be startup time, and these are very small numbers. But uh, we have uh, just in time compilation at the top, um, ahead of time, and Universal. And these uh, specs are for the Tour of Heroes demo. And just in time comes in at uh, about one second ahead of time is. Uh, 280 milliseconds, and then the Angular Universal app comes in at 40 milliseconds. And so um, they have a, a mobile um, chart as well, and the, and the times are like 35 seconds, 5 seconds, and then Universal is still at 4 seconds. And so this is about a 25%, uh, 25 times increase. So even if this doesn't hold true linearly as your app scales, there's still a, a large enough margin that you're going to see a big benefit um, in that first initial render that your user sees. And we'll kind of get into more of how that plays in um, with some of the other aspects of Universal. Um, <clears throat> so some of the other things before most, it's not just the initial render, which is kind of one of the, the big things, but um, it can also be beneficial with slow API. So if you have a, a route that your app hits that's calling a bunch of other things in slow, you can cache that and very easily render that. Uh, to the client server side, and then on the back end, you can uh, modify how often you update that um, that cached HTML. Um, another use case would be certain visualizations. So if you're doing heavy um, charts and uh, you know things with D3, a lot of data, again, you can cache that on the client, serve it up as a static string to the to the user, and just plug that in, uh, you know, into a component on your app. Uh, another big area is SEO, and um, with Angular, they've gotten really good at crawling Angular, or with uh, Google, they've gotten really good with crawling Angular apps. Um, however, some of the other search engines aren't as good, and they still rely on static content. And so there are some incapabilities of JavaScript, and then, um, you know, issues with async loading that can lead to a less than imperfect index. So Angular Universal is going to give all the search engines static content for your routes and serve it up, you know, as best as possible for, for an index score. Um, again, since it's static, the crawler can determine exactly how long it takes for the user sees content, so you're going to get a very accurate uh, rating. And um, <clears throat> the Angular Universal team, they note that server-side rendering is not the future for SEO, but for right now, it's really hard to beat. So. Uh, another area that this can help in is browser support. Um, since you have the ability to choose whether to send static content through Angular Universal or bootstrap the app, 
um, natively, um, you can you know, use the latest and greatest technologies with the evergreen browsers. Um, and some, for some of the older ones, you know, i.e., you can send them static content. Um, and so you, don't, you can kind of avoid some of these issues where you're building you know, feature support just for certain browsers. You can just render the app as it's supposed to be, send them static content, um, and avoid that problem. Um, again, yeah, same thing. Uh, you can serve completely server-side rendered uh, sites to the older browsers, uh, giving the evergreen browsers a full client app. It also helps with uh, accessibility, as uh, most screen re readers generally work better with server-side rendered content um, than they do with dynamic client rendered content. Uh, another area is link previews. So if you've ever copied a link into like Facebook or Slack or some of those other things, you'll get that little uh, link preview with you know the content, a little picture, um, and those really rely on static content. So if you have a fully dynamic app, it can be really hard for certain sites to correctly render a link preview. So things like Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> static content will help you out a lot with that. And if we look at what's available today and coming soon, um, it is integrated into the Platform API into Core. Uh, they do have support the title and meta services on the server. Um, there are still quite a few things in progress. Um, the documentation uh, is kind of lacking. I mean, there's, there's a decent amount on um, on the uh, Angular.io site, um, but there's still there's still definitely more work to be done. Um, they're supporting um, the Node engines, and they're also developing um, some of the other uh, middlewares for Happy and Express and um, ASP.NET Core. So, and just regarding that first point, I think we mentioned this before, but um, you know, Angular Universal started out as a community project. It's now been folded into the core and is a you know first party part of Angular. Uh, so this is the new uh, platform server module. So you'll see a lot of um, you know older documentation things like that that still reference the old Angular Universal repository and things like that. And there are still you know some um, sites that are still up with that old documentation that stuff is you know being migrated and transformed now and a lot of the work that's happening to you know to do that is happening now <clears throat> yeah um a couple more things in 4.1 that are coming um we're definitely adding some hooks into the render module um state transfer which i think adam will talk a little bit about uh, in his demo is coming and um, obviously they're in, in uh, increasing the performance and stress test since it's still kind of early on that's a little bit in flux um, and obviously making it easier to write tests for universal uh, components um, which we'll talk a little bit later about how that's uh, some of the difficulties around that um, they're also going to add um, support for app showcases so for your progressive web apps um, the CLI support, which Adam, I guess, can can again talk to more uh, about, is lacking a little bit. You uh, you do have to kind of roll your own a little bit at this point, so I think that's hurting the uh, adoption rate right now. But it is still early. Um, Angular Material Two uh, does work, although there are some workarounds that are needed to uh, make that work, and um, support for Java backends. Um, <clears throat> so in 5 and beyond, a full client rehydration strategy, there is a uh, module or library called Preboot, which we're going to talk about here in a second, that handles a lot of that. Um, so it looks like the Angular team is going to work on uh, that as well. And, I'm yeah? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm just curious, you can probably get some reviews to show, what do you mean by rehydration? Yeah, yeah so... Um, the, the, the overflow or the overview is that uh, if you go down the Angular Universal route, um, the server is going to render your content, your components, into a static string of HTML and CSS. And it's going to send that up to the client very quick. And the browser is going to load it and it's going to sit there and look great. Um, but there's not going to be any JavaScript yet. There's no compilation, things like that. So there is a transition or a handoff 
to when the app actually bootstraps on the client and you get all your functionality that you've written in your components and, and services and things like that. So there is a, um, there's a transition period uh, in pre-boot, which we're going to talk about in a second, uh, as we're going to go into a little more about what that does. Um, but there is, um, there's a lot of functionality you have in, in that handoff okay. from static content to your full Angular app. So the boot configuration is the addition of functionality? Uh, yes. Yeah. In this use case. Yeah. In this particular case. Cool. Good question, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Easier to support third-party libraries uh, that aren't universal aware. Uh, this is going to come up in some of the gotchas here soon. Um, the kind of the, the thing you have to work on or, or, or uh, be aware about is you're using um, these browser concepts in a non-browser environment. Um, so they're going to work on making that easier as well. Um, and then a protocol to uh, communicate with different uh, language backends. Um, this is an interesting link to kind of read through if you kind of scroll down to the bottom and see where they've, they've gone to, but um, the material design team is working on uh, supporting Angular Universal, and that goes back to we have all these browser components uh, that rely on things that just don't exist on the server, things like the window ob uh, object and, and document. Um, so uh, the material team is working on uh, adding support for that, and it is there are reports of it uh, working right now, um, but it's not without, you know, quite a few hacks, and it's definitely it's constantly changing. So, so some of the gotchas. This is what kind of what we're getting into. Um, browser types like window, document, navigator, they just don't exist on the server, and so a lot of uh, Angular and other components rely on these things, and we have to uh, handle that on the server with them not existing. Um, so they they do have an, a way to work around with this and you can inject uh, the platform ID <clears throat> uh, to run you know kind of logic checks to see where you're at uh, so angular can be aware of where it's being rendered um, so you can see uh, yeah, we have a question here. It, how does this affect the way the thing is rendered if the site is rendered in one browser it's not necessarily going to be exactly the same as any other site is rendered so if it renders something on the server then it hydrates <clears throat> jump around is there we render with a different actual browser so depending on what you're what you're rendering yes that is something that is a concern because some components deal with you know um, dynamic aspects of the viewport itself right mm -hmm. um, so they talked a little bit about this at ngconf but um, not too much in terms of specifics but essentially having a mechanism to basically um, Provide hooks so that you could say um, defer those those that kind of that logic until it's actually on the client. Um, so you could render something uh, at least you know, get um, you know something in front of your user. Yeah, the cam is ready. To right, and then one, once the JavaScript, um, you know, once the application boots and the client takes over, um, you can run those pieces. And I think that's part of what um, you know that whole like rehydration strategy would, would deal. with some of those issues. Okay. Yeah, they definitely mission uh, hooks for handling those use cases to come. Mm -hmm. um, but just from a high level, simple, you know, basic logic, um, you would inject your platform ID and then uh, inject these is platform browser, is platform server, um, and you can toggle your logic depending on where you're at if you run into a specific use case where things just aren't working out the way you expect. Um, another gotcha that they mention is uh, manipulating the na native element, and again, uh, you know, we're talking about browser-specific things here, um, and they recommend this workaround using the renderer. So if you are, you know, modifying, you know, your element style or things like that, um, again, use their predefined uh, methods for doing that. Um, this will help also with changing the view. So um, if your app uses the router link, you can still navigate around um, in the Angular Universal app before the bootstrap occurs. Um, so this will occur, allow that to still happen. What is it? Does run reach router static? Um, yeah, I I don't know the specifics of 
the router link navigation through the static site, um, but I do know that it, it, will, it will navigate using the router link. Um, if it's like a dynamic um, state change, and that's, that's a little bit different, that will work, but um, <clears throat> from what I've read, the, na the router link uh, will work. Um, so preboot. So this kind of handles that again. That transition from I have the static content rendered on my page, and in the background we're downloading uh, the Angular app and it's bootstrapping. Um, and so preboot is going to do quite a few things. Um, one of the things it's going to do is it's from the minute it's your static content's loaded, it's going to record all of your events. And once that bootstrap is complete, it's going to play them all back. And so if you have a form and your user starts getting halfway through it, and then all of a sudden your app took a while to load and it bootstraps, it's gonna play back all those things and your app state is gonna be as if it would have bootstrapped from the get-go. Um, and there's several events and uh, you know, listeners you can configure and uh, determine which ones are replayed, which ones aren't, and how, they're, how they are replayed. Um, there's also gonna be a hook to respond immediately to events, so if you have a use case um, where something needs to happen right away and not wait for the bootstrap to occur, um, there's going to be hooks to allow that to happen as well. A, uh, another cool thing is um, that it's going to handle is uh, like focus. So um, if you're on the zip code uh, input of a form and at bootstraps, it's going to main, it's going to know what input you are focused on and refocus the cursor back in that point. So it's going to try to make it as seamless as possible. Um, happen happen very quickly, and hopefully the user you know, doesn't know what's occurred, or that a, a transition has occurred. Um, and again, they're going to buffer this client side rendering and make it uh, hopefully unnoticeable. Uh, and lastly, uh, for some reason, something hangs, and your user gets the end of your form or hits some submit on a credit card form or something like that. You can uh, use Preboot to freeze the app and essentially wait. Uh, for your app to bootstrap, and then you can run your client side uh, validation. Um, there's lots of different use cases, but if for some reason you don't want the user to continue on with your static site, uh, you can have it hit the pause button and wait for the rest of the app to bootstrap. Um, so Preboot's going to handle uh, a lot of this, uh, have a, going from a static site to a full Angular uh, bootstrapped app.